Let me tell you a little bit about the man you're about to hear from, and you are in for a big treat. John C.J. currently serves as president of Global Creative for Fast Retailing's global fashion and apparel brands, including Uniglo, Theory, J Brand, Princess, Tam Tam. With the founder, Jay oversees all aspects of creativity from marketing, communications, product, design, interior, architecture, and digital content. He works with Uniglo Sports and Cultural Ambassadors. He selects designs on fashion collaborations, as well as special programs in the arts, including artist and museum relationships. Jay has offices in Tokyo, Portland, and New York City, and is opening R&D centers in key cities around the world. Previously, he was the president and creative director of GX Creative Consultancy in partnership with Wyden and Kennedy in Portland. He was a partner at Wyden Kennedy for 21 years, serving with Dan Wyden as global creative director and part of the global management team and a trustee of Wyden and Kennedy Trust. He also oversees Studio J, his longtime independent creative studio, which develops and invests in lifestyle concepts and product ideas. He has served as consultant to the Ace Hotels. He most, his most recent project was the design of The Ride by Paige Powell at the Portland Art Museum, an exhibition of previously unseen videos and photographs of Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, and Andy Warhol during the influential art scene in Manhattan in the 1980s and 90s. He has received many awards and citations, and here are a few. He was named the top 10 influential art director of the past 40 years by Graphic Design USA magazine, inducted into the Art Director's Hall of Fame, named by Fast Company magazine as 100 Most Creative in Business, and ID Magazine 40 Most Influential in Design. The man does not sleep. We know this because sometimes we get emails at 3 a.m. Jay has lectured at various international symposiums, including the Wexner Center of Arts and the Creative Festival in Cannes, France, and right here in Bend, Oregon. Please join me in welcoming John C. No. J. to the stage. Okay, hello again. And thank you for staying for the long, long day here. Uh, I have to tell you a little story about that middle initial thing, you know, um, John CJ, because I have this horrible reputation of never sleeping because I do email all throughout the middle of the night. And someone said to uh, an associate, uh, to another person, said, oh, I met John J uh, yesterday. And he said, which one? He says, how do you know you met the right one? He said, no, 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 I met John CJ. He says, that's my point. How do you know there's not a John A.J. or a John B.J. somewhere in the world? You know, so maybe, maybe you didn't meet the real one. So I can assure you, unfortunately, in the world, there's only one, and that's me. And I'm here, and I'm so proud to be here to simply say hello. Because what, a, what Brad was saying to me last night at dinner about what a wonderful transformation this community has gone through is just extraordinary. And I'm going to talk a little bit further about that, uh, about that because I was here four years ago and had the inkling of something that was happening, and I think we are witnessing a, a sea change here. So, why are we here? I want to use this quote as the inspiration. He was the lead designer for Isimiyaki, one of the greatest fashion designers of all time. I have the great pleasure of working with him, and he says that inspiration begins with conversation. And I think that's the hallmark of the Ben Design uh, conference to have this conversation, even though I'm on the stage, but hopefully later on we'll have personal conversations and the conversations amongst, you, amongst yourself and then over the next day will be very, very important because the conference will live on long after tomorrow. So David Brooks, one of my favorite writers in the New York Times, calls inspiration, it's always more active than mere appreciation. And there's a thrilling feeling of elevation, a burst of energy, and an awareness of enlarged possibilities. Well, hopefully that's why the Ben Design Conference will have a long lifetime creating opportunities for this. Inspiration is not earned. Your investment and time prepares you for inspiration, but inspiration is a gift that goes beyond anything that you could have deserved. And it's a beautiful contagion that passes through individuals. The future is right here in Bend. So, 
A couple of things here, this is really interesting. I do a lot of research. As a designer and as a creative person, I do a lot of research. Look at this. Knowledge is doubled every 150 years. Today, knowledge is doubling every two years. And by 2020, it will double every 72 hours. At the height of its power, and this is, again, I'm trying to illustrate change, and a lot of this I'm giving in Japan to make sure they understand how fast the world is changing. At the height of its power, photography company Kodak employed more than 140,000 people, worth $28 billion, but today it's bankrupt, and the new face of digital photography has become our friend Instagram. Instagram was sold to Facebook for a billion in 2012, 13 employees. So what I'm trying to say to my friends in Japan and all over is that the competition is fierce and it's everywhere, and just because you are an island, don't think you are protected from competition. Because the creative director that is competing for that best job, for that best client, is not sitting across the street from you or even on your island. It's, he's sitting somewhere in Rio, in London, in Shanghai, in Bangalore, somewhere. So we have to keep this in mind. And that average is over. We don't go out for an average dinner. We don't like working with average clients. We don't like giving average services or average design. The trend, Thomas Friedman, is that for more and more jobs, average is over. Thanks to the merger and advances in globalization and information technology revolution, every boss now has a cheaper, easier access to more above average software, automation, robotics, cheap labor, cheap genius, than ever before. It's very daunting, but what's more daunting is the problem that it has created in this country and the forgotten people who have this is left behind and why it's so important to listen to the voices of the entire country, not just to a few. In a connected world, unless your skills are world class, you become a commodity. Here's the point why I think this is so worthwhile here today. The end of reflection. The very idea that most of our friends are here and not here. With devices distracting us, opportunities for introspection becomes infrequent. I flew here yesterday uh, because I have to go back right away, and Brad Clofield chose to drive here because of introspection. So he could be inspired by the snow, by the trees, by the weather, by the environment, but that three and a half hours of introspection was worth it for him. I should have learned. I should have come with him. In a 16-hour day, we turn on or check our phones, I see some of you doing it, 85 times a day, eating up once every 11 minutes. Once every 11 minutes. So, the internet rewards speed over all else, a quality at odds with deliberate thought, and our appetite for, for velocity is only increasing as data transfer rates improve. There has been a long-standing movement for 15 years or so, maybe longer in Japan, that is related to the slow cooking movement of America, but it is a slow living movement, and it's one in search of quality because it is a culture and a country that is directly related to craft and quality. We've adopted the Google idea of the mind, which is that you have a question, you can answer it quickly. Close-ended, well-defined questions lost in that concept is that there's also this open-ended way of thinking, being open-minded about things, where you're not always trying to answer the question. And the other part is context. When you get the answer off of Google, you have no cultural context. You get the answer, but no context. That's dangerous, especially for creative people, because what you're designing then is off the surface and not substantial and, and deeper into culture. You're trying to go to where that thought leads you, and as a society, we're saying that that way of thinking, meaning the quality way, the introspective way, isn't viewed, isn't as important anymore and it's being viewed as being inefficient. Well, it's only inefficient if you don't care about quality. 
That's the word that I'd love to spend more time with you. And I hope I will be able to express some of this through some of the work I'm going to show. So one of the great challenges that we face in all facets of work is quality. And how can Ben, how can little old Ben answer this universal challenge? Just yesterday, Forbes named Bend as the number one small city in America good for business. Now, you can say someone's smoking something funny somewhere, but it's something. Take it. Take it to the bank and make use of that. So, why am I here? I'm here to talk about that issue of quality and how Ben can be, perhaps be a contributor. I should give a little bit of context. So if you Google me, you'll find out that this fancy title that I have and all this stuff. This is the company, one of the companies, the lead company that I work for. This is the store. You, we have a switch, and you can switch the facade, the lights on this facade, back and forth. It's called Uniqlo. Now, the issue about Uniqlo is that it makes contemporary casual clothing a Western invention. So when they decided to come to America, I wasn't with the company then, I said to the founder, wow, that's like selling curry to India and rice to China, so you're, going to, so you're going to be selling casual apparel in America? So what, why should you exist as a company? The DNA of the company is thousands of years of, of Japan. So the quality issue is inbreded in the conversation. We do not make disposable clothing. And the clothing that we make follows a, a process of kaizen, which means constant improvement. Now, you know that term from Toyota, perhaps, but you don't think of it in terms of apparel, especially inexpensive apparel, especially basic apparel. So you look at that navy blue Shetland V-neck sweater, and you think that's the same sweater that you bought two years ago or two seasons ago. That sweater has been improved, sometimes by 1%, sometimes by innovation in pricing, sometimes by technology. It can be 100% improvement, or it could be just a tiny bit improvement. How did this happen? 1998, when I opened Wyden and Kennedy, I decided to move to Japan to open Wyden and Kennedy in Asia. I discovered that most American agencies did not care about Japanese business. They were only there to take the money out and take it back to America. They were not good citizens. They were simply a post office taking money out. I met him, and I was determined to have Japanese clients. That's really hard in Japan. It's really hard because it's dominated by two agencies that dominate everything that far beyond uh, the definition of what an ad agency is, they far s surpass. It's hard to explain how powerful they are. But I met him. This is out today. If you don't know BOF, it's a great website on fashion and the apparel industry and retail. This is the lead story. Without a soul, a company is nothing. This is why I'm working here now. Why did I give up Portland, Oregon? Why did I give up 20 years of partnership there? Because I needed to go somewhere to refresh myself, to reinvent myself, but also to have an opportunity to work with this man. He is the client. He and I are Brad Cofield's client. I want to tell you a story. This is our store in Paris. See the upper row? So the rent, this is before I was there, a few years ago. So the rent, all, the business plan was, was decided. It was all agreed upon. The lease was already about to be designed. It was about to be announced to the public. Uniglo was going to take this wonderful space in the opera, take the two floors, and open its first store in Paris. The architect and designer, Katyama-san at Wonderwall, couldn't sleep the night before the press conference. He couldn't sleep because he knew that if we did not take that top floor, we have no control over that top floor, and other brands could be in that space, and other things could be up. You have no idea what's going to be up there, and it's going to affect us. It's going to affect the way we feel about ourselves, the way our product is presented. So he got up at 6.30, went to the hotel, called from the lobby up to Mr. Nye, and asked for an appointment at 7 a.m. He pleaded with Mr. Nye, take the top floor. I know it's millions of dollars in rent, 
millions and millions of dollars in rent, but take the top floor. You know, I looked at the contract, tore up the lease, asked the lawyers to bring a new one. Ladies and gentlemen, we're taking all three floors. We cannot let another brand intrude onto our brand. The numbers are staggering out there, and those numbers of success put a great onus on us to be responsible, to be greatly responsible. So sustainability is number one target for us right now. Transparency, we're not there yet, but I tell you why the challenge is so great for us. Do you know what 1111 is? It's called Singles Day, created by the incredible Jack Ma, one of the most inspiring people I've ever met at Alibaba. When we were meeting with Jack, he was telling me about the e-commerce business of Alibaba. And he said, right now, John, we are moving 89,000 pieces of, of, of merchandise sales per second. Per second. I'm trying to wrap my head around what that, I can't even understand what that means. So he created this holiday for single people called Singles Day on 1111. And I think the sales were last year almost 10 billion. The sale is 24 hours. That's it. Starts in the, at 6 a.m. or whatever, it goes 24 hours. This is the announcement when they kick it off. He is bringing Hollywood, a lot of superstars in. So when Bond, the new Bond film launched, he brought all the stars in. That's Jack on the left. In 24 hours, our sales were $100 million. Four or five years ago, five years ago, I had the great honor and pleasure of working in collaboration with uh, the late Alex Calderwood, the founder of the Ace Hotel. And we did an issue of Archetype called X. And X, the reason why X was that it's the international symbol of collaboration and connection amongst youth and subcultures. So years ago, when I used to visit Japan, I would see brands, competing brands, that would collaborate with each other, which is unheard of in the West, to have two sneaker companies collaborate with you, two apparel companies collaborate. So it would be brand, X, brand. This X symbol is the symbol of multiplying your power, creativity, and influence by collaborating with another source of inspiration. Culture. The most popular search word in 2014, culture. Yet, so many of our companies lack any depth of knowledge or understanding or appreciation of what culture really is. So why is it so important today? Well, some people will say culture is the new media. So, Uniglo's goal is to improve the lives of everyone everywhere and bring the highest quality to the greatest number of people. I would say that's the biggest shift for me personally. So suddenly my job is to bring the greatest quality, the highest level of quality to the greatest number of people. And what that defies is all of my learning in advertising, working with Nike for 20 years, and what is a, a typical uh, target audience and so forth, those kind of questions. Because typically, it would be 14 to 23, alpha male, active in sports, da 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 His answer, Mr. and I, was, well, that's easy, John. Everyone. We respect everyone. I want to bring quality to everyone. I want to bring innovation to everyone. I don't need to appeal to, to the A-listers and to the influencers and hope that it's going to filter down to the common people. Let's start with everyone. So the advancement, we believe, of cultural learning and understanding is an important step to our goal. Why is that? Selfishly, no one really understands Japanese culture here. So if they look at that T-shirt, they look at those sweats, they look at that sweater, they go, Looks the same to me as someone else's. So unless they understand the depth of thinking, the thoughtfulness that we put behind very simple things that are commodities, quite frankly, 
you know, one of the great skills, one of the great magical skills that the Japanese culture has is that it objectifies everything. So it can take, and this is how it works, the guy who does pants, the woman who does the sweaters, they can put a pair of pants on a table and all they see are khakis. They see nothing else, just the khakis. So they're able to improve that thing. So in Kaizen, they're able to look at those pants and improve it season by season by season. We say that there's an example, there's a philosophy of simple made better. In many companies, simplicity is the final endpoint. For us, it's the entry point. And once you achieve that simplicity to that degree, it doesn't mean that you can't improve it. So we're not afraid of changing a classic as long as we can keep the inherent qualities and keep improving it. So that's why our technology is about keeping you warmer, but it's also about keeping you lighter when you're warmer. So anyone can wear layers upon layers and layers and keep warmer. The whole point is to be warmer but lighter, and then cheaper, affordable. So one of the ways that um, one of my jobs is to, and I've had a long history. I see some ex-associates of mine in the back here. They know of my immersion, what I, what I brought to Nike and Widen was this constant immersion to the culture. So by expressing some classical Japanese culture to the young people in the world, it helps them to understand where we're from. So kabuki. It represents traditional Japanese culture, entertainment, but when it was introduced 400 years ago, it was pop culture, it was cutting edge, and we use uh, Enomsoki-san, who's appearing in the dramatic performance in Uniqlo the Luminator, and the creative direction was the king of streetwear. So you have this classic 400-year-old Japanese tradition and the king of streetwear all coming together with the lead performer of the Kabuki theater performing around the world. This was Paris. So we turn the entire store into a Kabuki theater, into a Kabuki boutique. This is the store. So as the guests come in, there's Kabuki product all around the store. So all the traditional wear here that was displayed was then transferred into affordable clothing so that young people could, uh, could uh, have a piece of this culture. And then we wrapped a Fifth Avenue store for the performance when they arrived from Paris. And here's a little video. Their sound. So last week I was in Paris and I presented to the Ministry of Culture and they brought 25 of the top museums to the table, including all the great ones and including some great smaller ones. So the Louvre, uh, Palais de Tokyo, all of them were there. And the first thing I said to them is that of course they're, they know of our, our, our relationship and our collaboration with cultural institutions. And the first thing I said to them was that we're not a bank. 
We're not a bank here. So don't come to me with feeble ideas of marketing and say, I can put your logo on a napkin. Oh, your logo will be on a banner, and your logo is going to be on the ticket, and those will be some signs at the dinner. That's not, we're not interested. We're interested in a true collaboration. Now, that's difficult because they have to protect their turf and not go too far into the commerce side. So finding that sweet spot where we're an equal partner at the table and can exchange ideas, we're not a bank. The Museum of Modern Art is a perfect example. We sponsor free nights. That was a key, that was an entree. That was important for them and important for us. And the global flagship store is just around the corner. So our interest in contemporary art and MoMA only grows with our fascination with art and artists. So that's something that I am heavily involved in is the collaboration with artists and, and artistic groups. So we launched Surprise New York, SPRZ, collaborating with MoMA to produce a 200-piece collection of products, including t-shirts, accessories, and uh, other things, art, but and using the most iconic artists, and this is just a few, but of course the most sellable ones, of course, are the most visual ones, uh, Warhol, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Keith Haring. And we opened a store for SPRZ on the second floor, a half a block from MoMA. So free ticket night, Monday nights. Lines form for the opening. And these are the products working with MoMA with Jean-Michel Basquiat's artwork. Stairs that lead up to the SPRZ shop. International artists that collaborate. This is all t-shirts only on the second floor. The other thing, little hints. Um, when you come to the store, you will never see anything not folded correctly. You will never see a piece of paper on the floor. You will never see anything dirty on top of the counter, never because our job is to, to welcome you in the most respectful way, and the way we can be respectful is to be clean and tidy and, and make the house wonderful for you. So service is important. That's from Japan as well. So London culture, this is my second project, actually my first real one, uh, to reinvigorate the flagship store, re renovating the flagship store. So the flagship store in London on 311 used to be top three, floor, uh, three floors. So we took, when I arrived, I took the top two floors as well. But despite what you see on the street level here, I wanted the top two floors to service the, the, our community in a different way, or service the community. So I wanted it to be a place, a cultural hub for London where creative people could meet and share ideas and, and show their wares, show, their, show their, what they make. Because for us, London is probably one of the most creative cities in the world. It truly is a leading global city, and London has a very specific creative community. So, we renovated the store to transform it into a cultural hub, and we named interesting cultural ambassadors to be a part of our family. So we had uh, the theme of This Way to Utopia, because we found it was the closest thing to a creative utopia. Skepta, the great grime rapper, Transgender, transgender model Monroe Bergdorf, and Hannah Tajima, who is a fashion designer who designs for young Muslim women across the world. We had other representatives from film and dance, and they were not only models, but ambassadors, and so we asked each of them to curate those objects, those things that are important in their life, bring it to the store, and if those, those things were uh, available to be sold, we'll put, them on, we'll put them for sale as well. So, London is an incredibly vibrant bike community. So we chose two different bike cultures to collaborate with. So the upper two floors that I did were this new hub. So it's like an industrial space on the top two floors and very Katayama, Wonderwall, Japanese, neon, very electric, very white, very stainless on the, on the bottom three floors. So it's a complete change of environment when you come up. There's a rooftop, we have a, a record label, 
Um, you know, we have a, a, a pirate radio, not pirate, but a, a, a digital radio uh, station that operates on the top floor. We have lots of events on the roof. Now that winter's here, they have to come into the store. But we have a separate elevator. I put in a separate storefront. This is on the, underneath the stairs where people can just sit and look at the magazines and so forth. Your Skepta performing on opening night. And some of our ambassadors, Skepta on the right, Hana Tajima on the left, this way to Utopia. Monroe and Sean Frank. Now, we open our stores in a very traditional manner, so I'm happy to see next door here or nearby, there's a, uh, a taiko drumming uh, performance. We open the stores by very traditional things of breaking open the sake, uh, you know, kegs, having uh, taiko drummers perform, the, uh, you know, and create some excitement. But we always try to add local flavor and mix it with, with the traditional uh, kind of entertainment. So these people were in front of the store as we were getting ready to set up for cutting the ribbon on opening day in London. Their significance was they were the stars of the commercials that we created to introduce this way to Utopia, to London. So there's been a lot of interesting discussions today about love versus money, about blurring the edges, and I'll, I'll say that I've had a long career of, of being successful doing something that's, I know it's not all that easy, but I've been able to totally confuse myself between vacation and vocation. I have been in so many situations where I have to pinch myself, and I am working, I'm standing there with the client, and I'm going, holy, I wish I could just swear right now, but oh, oh my God, is this real? What I'm experiencing, what I am learning right now, this is work. Holy smokes. And I, can just, I could do an hour just on quick time examples of those things. This is just one example. Singapore. Here's a challenge for us. 
25 stores already in Singapore. Certainly no mystery. Certainly they know us. They know us from J Japan, of course. So we're opening our fir first flagship store. Yet, on opening day, 2,000 people were in line for on, in the, before the store opened. So we invited the best of the local community, coders, videographers, musicians, DJs, everything. The music in the store was created locally. The videos, everything. The murals, everything was created with local artists. We have art classes every weekend on the top floor. We broadcast your video work your, on all the monitors, 300 of them through, throughout the store. Ambassadors that were very unusual, especially the one in the middle, 82 years old, rock and roll guitarist. And the amazing reception that we've had with the local community, this is our store on Saturday mornings. Bring the world. So one of the things I've had the great pleasure of hiring my first person hired uh, in the last 18 months since I've joined is someone that is helping me to make sure that we bring quality events and share these kind of quality experiences in all of our flagship stores. So whatever we're doing in London, we bring to Tokyo. Whatever we're doing in New York, we'll bring to Singapore. Whatever we're doing in Singapore, we'll bring to London. That's her job, and to create these experiences. The Tate. This one's really interesting because this is the most visited contemporary art center in the world, the highest attendance in the world. And yet, they were willing to collaborate with us. They were, it was extraordinary that they were willing to sit at the table and listen, at least entertain us, about ideas on content. We are not a bank. So it was a new high point in the cultural landscape of London. In Uniqlo, of course, decided to pay for free admission on Fridays. And for the opening, we had 10-minute talks that were really popular throughout the museum that we were sponsors of. So 10-minute talks with an expert. You don't have to hang out for, the, for a whole hour, or you, have to li you don't have to listen to headsets. Just you want to know something about this floor, that painting, that sculpture. We have experts on art that will take you for 10 minutes. This is the new Herzog de Miron building. And of course, the shape is extraordinary. We, had, we took the top floor of the new building and, called, and, and really had uh, a, a wonderful exchange with London, asking them, and you have to remember, Brexit has happened, what is your future? Which direction do you want London to go? Let's have a dialogue. As a creative institution, what can we do to foster this dialogue? We took the shape of the building and put them in our store windows and made that kind of iconic, that shape. We were introduced to all interesting local illustrators and artists by the Tate, so we hope to be working with these people in the future. London dreaming was the theme of our question about what is the direction of the city, where are we going? And we had something like eight million impressions on that opening weekend. Voted with these ribbons. So that was just the beginning opening weekend, and now I'm really excited of really getting to the meat of matters now with the Tate. Soho. 
We just celebrated our 10th anniversary in America. It, the first store was in Soho. This is the store, kind of renovated. We didn't really do the full scale. We changed a, a couple floors. Increased our art in our SPRZ area on the top floor and underneath. So massive display of Basquiat, Warhol, and so forth. So Soho was chosen because of its legacy and creativity. We wanted to enter America in a, through a cultural point, through, a, through an eye of a needle of creativity. We thought Soho's legacy in creativity was important. So that's why we chose Soho. And that's why we will remain in Soho and grow in terms of our content. Now, Tokyo, of course, for all of those who are writers and understand all this threat about print is dead, print is so alive in Japan, it is unbelievable. Tea site, magazine stores, bookstores, midnight to two o'clock are packed. The coffee shops are packed with books. Bookstores are packed. So my dream was to open a Tokyo magazine shop in Soho. So I scribbled it on a piece of paper. I didn't really design it that much, but I scribbled the idea and gave it to the designers, and voila, three weeks later, there it is. So please come to the bookstore in Tokyo. We work fast. We have, I can't tell you, I'm just dying. I had to take it out because the announcement was supposed to have been last week, and we have an, a big surprise coming in here related to art in Soho. Here are the magazines. So I get to work with some amazing fashion designers, but this man is incredible. Former creative director for Hermes, now he did, uh, well, um, let me share. So he first began our collaboration with Uniglo as a guest designer of doing a capsule collection, expressing his version of lifewear. Lifewear is what we make. Lifewear is all, everything we make is under the umbrella of lifewear. Th things to be relevant to your everyday life. So very successful startup, and we decided to go deeper because one of the things that we don't like about these fashion relationships is that they're kind of one-offs. They appear once, they, just, they sell out, there's a lot of hype, a lot of press, people line up, there's even you know, riots in the front door. We don't like that. We want to have a sustained relationship. So we built a new creative center in Paris for Christophe Lemaire. So this is Christophe and his associate, Sarah, when they were doing the Uniqlo capsule collection. The reviews for the new work that we're doing said, how do they describe it? Paris Fashion Week, favorite Christophe Lemaire, plus cult Japanese high street store equals fashion reinvention that we all want a piece of. This is the first collection. The new collection is permanent. It's not a capsule collection, but we opened, uh, there was earlier mention about my opening uh, R&D creative centers around the world. This was one of them. And it's based on the creation of this new line called the U Collection. This is a studio, it's about two months old. And Christoph is no longer the designer, he is artistic director, and everyone else is a designer. What he said, I love this quote, I'm trying to make clothes that you need as well as you want to bring quality, taste, and style, and if possible, poetry in something that is made for every day. It's so easy to think about everyday things and basics as lacking that sense of poetry, that sense of finesse, that sense of quality. It's not just quality, it's poetry. These are in the stores, just appeared this week. Cause. Some of you know him very well. Our collaboration with artist Cause brought global fans, new and old, together at all of our Uniqlo stores around the world, especially our flagship stores. Uniqlo opened new doors for the artists, and the results were astounding. Our China Uniqlo stores broke all sales records in the opening hours. Here's Brian Cause in his studio in Brooklyn. Now, what's interesting about him is that he started on the street back in the late 90s during school. He started as a graffiti artist, doing typical wild style, all the classic you know, street art. Then he graduated into something, he took over all the ads in the bus shelters and changed them, changed the Calvin Klein ads, changed the Kate Moss ads, and redid them. 
what these, all of these artists have that was a secret key that, and this is a, they say that there's only one master key that opens all of these uh, boxes, light boxes in America. So all those things with the bus shelter art that can be opened with one master key. So Brian then graduated and now he is hugely celebrated as an artist around the world. But how did he get here? He was, I met him first in Japan. He had a huge cult following in Japan because they are, the young kids there are so deeply ingrained in global culture, in studying everything about us, about the world. Here he is with Nigo, who's the creative director, works with me. Here's the front of the New York store, opening day. Here are the ads. Now this is in Beijing, the line as you can see, forming in the morning, doors open, day one we sold 310,000 cause t-shirts in one country alone. So what is the greatest collaboration of all in my opinion? You didn't know Morgan lived here, did you? No, of course, I'm, I'm using him as a reference to God. <laughs> and what did they create in this collaboration? They created this. It's all around you. It's the most inspiring resource that you have. They created this and this. She is your best partner. And it's just the beginning, the foundation of what you can do here. Now, I'll extend that foundation a little bit because your association, your closeness to Asia is very, very important and incredibly strategic. So Wabi Sabi, the Japanese art of finding beauty in imperfection in the profundity in nature and accepting the natural cycle of growth and decay and death. A redefinition for Westerners as to what is beautiful and what is long-standing, what is universal. This bowl. So bend, and why we're here, and design. The collaboration in design, with design. So design may once have existed to make the world attractive to the eye, but now it exists to make the world attractive to the mind. That's why wabi-sabi is important. For businesses, it's no longer enough to create a product that is reasonably priced and adequately functional. It must also be beautiful, unique, and meaningful. So Ben Plus, what could that plus mean? Perhaps what we can do here is to create the most sophisticated blend of culture, technology, design, and nature using what you have already, using what's already in your bloodstream, your DNA. What makes Uniglo so powerful and so unique is its Japanese DNA, even though it's making Western clothes. Your DNA is the most powerful thing that you have. Destroy the cliches and reinvent the concept of amorphic design. So if you're attracted to nature, what does nature do for you? Well, Isimiyaki was inspired by nature using the first to use synthetic fabrics. This is Kengo Kuma, architect. The significance of Kengo Kuma is that he's working in Portland and his first significant American piece of architecture are the Japanese gardens that will be opening in maybe a year or so. An extraordinary project. But, meantime, because he really loved this little woman who's a chef who cooks the Japanese food, who's the caterer for my lunches at, at, at my office, 
he boldly went to Kengo Kuma, who's doing the Olympic Stadium in Tokyo for the 2020 Olympics, and said, I'm opening a restaurant. Would you ever consider designing my restaurant? I'm a caterer, and I just saved enough money to open a, a dining room, and we're going to extend the catering into the dining room, but could you design it? It's opening in two weeks. Mark Newson, also influenced by nature. So what I'm saying is that nature is not enough. It's got to be beautiful, sophisticated, and at the highest level of design excellence. James Terrell. Of course, our, our old favorite, Buckminster Fuller. This is Ken Gokuma again. If you have a chance, I didn't put it in here, you know, Starbucks is extraordinary. Howard Schultz, our ex-client, is extremely tough on, on design of stores, and he wants to make sure that everything stays within brand and everything. But he gave Kumasan the freedom to design one that looks like this. It's not exactly like this, but a Starbucks that looks like this on the interior. It's extraordinary. Mr. Alto. Kengo Kuma. And here's my guy, Brad Clofield. Not that far. You can go have wine in this wonderful expression of Mother Nature. And this piece, the Mary Hill Overlook. If you've never visited this place, it's extraordinary. Brad designed this, had this before he had any buildings built. This was what his first piece that he had, the only piece he had in his portfolio. So when we went to him to ask him to be a candidate to design Wyden and Kennedy, he didn't show any models because he had no models. He didn't design anything. He had no buildings yet. But this turned us on. And here's something I thought was really, really interesting. I don't know these people personally, but I thought in my research, this collaboration, this architectural firm connecting with the Tohono O'odham Nation to create futuristic baskets, Native American know-how and history and DNA in basket weaving combined with contemporary industrial design. We are connecting the weaving practices of Native American tradition to our practice and ar as architects. There is something we share deeply. Weaving is a material and social practice performed through ritual and architecture and can be understood in much the same way. Both use simple processes like repetition and iteration. Brad's work is very much like this. So this is a, not a metaphor, but it leads to the next, to one of my favorite friends, someone that I traveled a lot with in the past, Mr. Mark Parker. Many times, those times where I'm pinching myself, I'm saying, am I working or am I playing? It's with him. So every year we would plan, okay, Mark, you haven't been to Art Basel. We're going to Art Basel this year. He goes, John, okay, next year, let's go, to, let's go to Milan. We're going to the furniture fair next year. And we would always set up, the most, I try to outdo each other. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to, boom, he's going to introduce me to, boom. It's just an extraordinary relationship. Was. I don't work with them anymore. So this is in, don't miss, a Wired magazine, the issue on design. This is a portrait of Mark in his office in Portland. And when uh, Billy Sorrento, the creative director of Wired, was there photographing, taking this shot, he is texting me on the phone while he's in Mark's desk. He goes, John. Your picture is on Mark's desk. I go, no, show it to me. So he took a picture. Somehow in this, in this room, he, he found this little picture of me. <laughs> Nike's endless pursuit of solutions has led the company to some unexpected places, not least which is the global community of like-minded thinkers, creators, and innovators called upon by its various teams to break new boundaries and design. But I can tell you from the day, first week that I joined, the first thing I did was immerse ourselves together into local culture. In that case, it was New York City. In the rest, for the next 20 years, it was the world. Quote from Mark, 
We're lifting up rocks to find new solutions to problems. And we're looking in places that maybe many people aren't looking. Working with artists and designers, you get, a diff you get different points of view. That cross-pollination of creativity, to me, is really rich. That's why Brad hires artists to be consultants before he even starts the project. Because what does an artist do? They see what we can't see. The Guardian, creativity is the most powerful competitive advantage a business can have. Remember that. This is what you do. You are the most powerful competitive advantage a business can have. The trick is, is to find the clients who understand that and believe that. They continue, companies need to fizz with new ideas and fresh thinking, but there's one problem. There just aren't enough fizzy people around. So I used to say, you know, I have a lot of friends in New York who dress incredibly. They have a wardrobe that could choke a horse. I mean, it's unbelievable how well put together they are. But you know what? That doesn't mean they're designers. It doesn't mean they're fashion designers. They not, may not even mean they're a stylist. They have great personal taste. Design is a skill. Design you have to learn. Design is not born. You have to learn it. You have to, you have to grow. So there are... Having ideas, get in line, dude. Everybody's got ideas. You got, I get approached, oh, I got ideas. Yeah, well, dude, here, the line's about 6,000 long in here. Get in line. So what you have ideas? What kind of ideas? What depth ideas? What is the, what is the cultural significance in the context of those ideas? I believe everyone is born creative, but it is educated out of us in school where we are taught literacy and numeracy. Sure, there are classes called writing and art, but what's really taught is conformity. That's the problem with case studies. When everyone rushes to the Harvard Business School and pulls out a case study, that's historical. Now, it's valuable to learn from other people's mistakes and successes, but think about the problem freshly with your own set of eyes. So, I, told, I said this morning, this is only my, maybe my third or fourth time in Bend, and I've, in, in, in all four times I never left a lot, these three square blocks. So I'm, I'm really learning. I actually ventured out with Christy way out there, like 10 blocks away today. So <laughs> to the future for you guys. What do you want to be? How will you use all of your natural resources? I don't mean the mountains and the rivers and the fields. I mean you. How will you be relevant to the next generation? Do you, individually, as a community, but individually, have a future? Think of your assets and potential collaborators. And who are they? Well, nature, I'm beating that horse to death, of course. Your size, number one city, small city in America for business. Your size is wonderful. And there's this vague thing called West Coast culture. You can define it however, but it is different from the rest of the world. Your distance from big cities is a gift. Widen Kennedy would never existed if it was in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Because it was in Portland, because it was away from the big cities, we weren't poisoned. But on the other hand, your closeness to Asia. Let's think about Asia. 2018, Winter Olympics. 2020, Tokyo Olympics. Where do you think the world is going? High thinking, relationship with higher education, and high making, your love of craft, your love of beautiful things, and the, your insistence on quality in everything that you do here. Another collaborator, the whole reason why we're even here, these wonderful people. And what's their mission? Scalehouse seeks to connect creative thinkers, providing opportunities for artists, congregation, and collaboration, cross-pollination, education, and exhibition. Evidence, round two, right here today. So Bend, never forget, is global. The internet is your most powerful ally. What you build here well, it can affect the world instantaneously. You are global. Ben is uniquely positioned to influence the world. 
Young creative talents are looking for a home. Everyone's talking about the weather and how wonderful it is. And that, that, that's, that's, the world is looking for that. When you can work anywhere, this is an advantage. They're looking for a home. And the new generation considers you know, other alternatives to a corporate job. Recruit the best creative thinkers and makers in the world. Make this place conducive and inviting for these people to come join you and join what you're making here. But go for the best. Diversity is powerful. Maybe not our strength yet. Maybe not our strength yet. And artists, creative makers, are amongst our most powerful our most powerful thinkers. I always say at Widen Kennedy, the most powerful strategists, our greatest strategy people, were our creative people. Making is thinking. So set your sights high. Don't be like some cities I know and be afraid of success. Don't wander in that territory of tall poppies and punish those people who are successful. Celebrate success. Celebrate aspiration. Ben, collaborate with the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>